My name is Jonathan Harker, and I'm going to tell you the story of Dracula. I'm going to tell it as it was documented by those of us who lived it. It's all here. Letters, diaries, newspaper clippings, notes and memoranda. The story happened, of course, a long time ago. But whenever I look at these documents, whenever I take up a letter from poor Lucy, a note from Professor Van Helsing, my own journal written at that terrible castle, it all comes back to life. I'm afraid nothing else in our lives, for those of us who survived, will be as memorable or as interesting to anyone as the events during that period between May the 3rd and November the 8th in the year 1889. It all began for me on the journey from London to Transylvania. I travelled for Mr. Hawkins, my employer, who was under commission to select a London residence for a certain titled gentleman from Hungary. Mr. Hawkins, being ill of health, sent me to make the necessary arrangements as requested by our client. I began my journal written in Pittman shorthand during the journey to the castle of Count Dracula. May 3rd. Only a glimpse of Budapest, then on. Now in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known parts of Europe. A district called Transylvania. There are few towns. Sometimes we see a castle on top of a steep hill. I could not find any map giving a location for the castle of Count Dracula. But his letters were explicit that all arrangements for my arrival would be made with the innkeeper at the Golden Crown Hotel in the town of Bistritza. It was on the dark side of twilight when we arrived. The hotel was thoroughly rustic, much to my delight, and I was evidently expected. Ah, Mr. Harker, we are expecting you, but the trains are seldom on the schedule, yes? Come. Come, your bags are brought to your room. You will like our hotel, I hope. Oh, I do. Charming. Very charming. Not elegant, yes. Exactly as I had hoped. I want to see the ways of your country all I can. Ah, yes. We hope you will enjoy the ways of our country, Mr. Harker. But come, our porter will show you to your room. Then come down quickly. We have dinner for you. Oh, and here, a letter for you, Mr. Harker. Thank you. from Count Dracula. He welcomes me, and the coach will leave for Bukovina tomorrow at three o'clock. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you, and will bring you to me. Well then, it is all arranged. Ah, Mr. Harker, here is your table. I hope you will enjoy our robber steak. You like paprika? Paprika, yes, but the red pepper. Robber steak turned out to be a highly seasoned beef with onion and bacon, strung on sticks and roasted over the fire. The wine, a golden meaty ash, produced a queer sting, but was not disagreeable. But I quickly became sleepy and went directly to my room after dinner. From my window, I could see that the country outside was completely dark. Some haze or low clouds hid the stars. Yes? Mr. Harker, may I come in, please, a moment? Oh, uh, yes. My pardon, Mr. Harker. Is everything all right? Indeed, it, it is very fine. Compliments of our hotel, Mr. Harker. You will like our Schlebewitz. May I pour? There. I, uh, thank you. I did thoroughly enjoy your steak. This will assure you of a good night's sleep. I'll need little help this night, I assure you. Perhaps. But you will have the bottle for your journey tomorrow. Ah, very fine. Very strong. Again, I thank you. The passage tomorrow, I presume by this note, has been arranged by Count Dracula? It has all been arranged, sir. And the coach will take me as far as the Borgo Pass? Yes, it will leave you there. 
A coach from the castle will be waiting. Yes, well, thank you again for the liquor. Must you go, Mr. Harker? Must you go there? Indeed. It will be the eve of St. George. I am not familiar with that celebration. When the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will arise. Ah, it is similar to our All Hallows, perhaps. You should wait another day before going. <laughs> I am most grateful for your concern, but I have business with Count Dracula, and I must go. I am in his employ. Do you know where you are going, and what you are going to, Mr. Harker? I know Count Dracula only by correspondence. I am anxious to see his castle. The name Dracula. It means in our language, devil. At least wait another day before leaving, Mr. Harker. I cannot. Though again, I appreciate your concern. My business with the Count, nothing can interfere with that. Well, have your brandy, Mr. Harker, and sleep well. Good night. Good night. The good woman meant well, of course. I wish there was more time to become acquainted with their superstitions and folklore. I did not sleep well that night. There were all sorts of odd dreams. Animals howling, dogs, or wolves. They carried on till nearly dawn. The next day, after another meal heavily spiced with paprika, the coach arrived and the passengers for Bukovina scrambled in. The small crowd gathered there seemed apprehensive about me. They talked gravely, glancing in my direction, a few of the older women crossing themselves. I presumed it had something to do with my destination, the castle of Count Dracula. Mr. Harker! Mr. Harker! Ah, madam, on my return, I hope I can remain longer in your charming town. I will try to arrange it. Mr. Harker, here, for you, for your safety, you must take this. <laughs> but, madam... You must take it, Mr. Harker. It is the eve of St. George. Here, keep it around your neck. So. A, a crucifix? Madam, it is not necessary, I'm sure. Keep it around your neck. It will protect you. But from what? It will protect you, Mr. Harker. From everything. Ready, sir. Uh, coming. Board. Well, thank you, madam. Uh, thank you, I'm sure. It will protect you, Mr. Hart. It will protect you. Protect me? From what? But I soon lost sight of such fears and questions in the beauty of the scene as we drove along. The green, sloping land full of forests what they call here the middle land. The road was rugged, but we flew over it in what seemed to be a feverish haste, soon entering the steep area of the Carpathians, great forests along the slopes, and in the distance, endless peaks of jagged rock. The late afternoon sun brought out all the glorious color. Many hours passed. We had stopped only briefly to light the coach lamps, then on. Even faster, the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on both sides. There were dark rolling clouds overhead, and in the air, a heavy, oppressive sense. My fellow passengers were mostly silent, but awake and apprehensive. We will share our bomb brandy, Mr. Harkin. It grows colder here as we approach Borgo Pass. And the good lady beside me offers you the ripe bread with goose fat. <laughs> thank you, and thank the good woman. I'm afraid I have no appetite. We approach the turn-off at Borgo. You must understand, Mr. Harker, we do not like this country hereabout. It is very wild, very evil to us. We do not like to stop. Someone will be waiting there for me to take me to the castle of Count Dracula. Count Dracula? I think we may be approaching now. Mr. Harker, we are at Borgo Pass. I do not see anyone here. Perhaps you are not expected after all. You should go on with us to Bukovina. Are you sure this is the right place? There is only one place, sir. There is no calèche for you. Ah! Ah! There is a coach. Hurry, sir. 
Denn die Toten reiten schnell. For the dead travel fast. From a German poem, Mr. Harker. Mr. Harker. Hurry, sir! Here are your bags! Thank you! This way, Mr. Harker. The calash is ready. It will be cold, sir. Here is a rug for you. And there is brandy under the sea. Thank you. Is it far? We shall be there before dawn, Mr. Harker. It was a strange, fearful drive. From the very start, the great black horses seemed to be flying through the night. The driver did not speak. Only once had I seen his face. Peculiar red eyes and sharp-looking teeth, very white. There were no lights and no stars. As we drove lower into the valley, all traces of the road seemed to be covered by mist. Nevertheless, the carriage drove frantically. The steep mountains seemed to cover us, but the darkness cut off all clear distinction between mountain, sky or valley. At first, only at a distance, then closer, the sound of animals surrounded us. I saw no creature outside the coach, but at times the monstrous cries of wolves seemed to be following the coach itself. There was no sound from the coachman, and from my position, I could detect no outline of him in the driver's seat. Then, just as suddenly, we had arrived. The courtyard of a vast, ruined castle from whose tall black windows came no ray of light. The mist was gone. The broken battlements of the castle showed a jagged line against the moonlit sky. The coachman was standing beside the coach, and when I descended, he quickly closed the door. And just as silently, led the coach across the yard and down one of the dark openings. Before me was a great door, studded with large nails. No sign of a bell or knocker. No one could hear my voice through those massive walls. I wasn't sure what to do. But I hadn't long to wait. Before me stood a tall old man, clean-shaven, except for a long white moustache, dressed from head to foot, in black. Welcome to my house, Mr. Harker. Enter freely, of your own will. Go safely, and leave some of the happiness you bring. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. Come in. The night air is chill, and you must eat and rest. Come with me, Mr. Harker. This way, please. Your baggage is in your room. I will see to your comforts myself. It is late, and my people are not available. It was a long journey. Very rugged country. Ah, yes. Is it not very beautiful? But so many miles can be exhausting. My castle, you see, is very old. Very large. It is, I dare say, very overwhelming. Thank you, Mr. Harker. I have lived here for a long, long time. Careful there, a broken step. Oh. Centuries old. It has many wounds from battles, from age. You will have time to explore it tomorrow during the day while I am away. This way, just up these steps. You see, old walls tell the time by their scars. There are many scars in the castle, Dracula. Here, Mr. Harker, I trust you will be comfortable. Well, 
Indeed, this is very pleasant. The fire has warmed the rooms for you. Now you must refresh yourself. When you are ready, I will join you in the other room where your supper is prepared. Till then, Mr. Harker. The light and warmth and the Count's courteous welcome dissipated all my doubts and fears. And I discovered I was half famished with hunger. So quickly making ready, I went into the other room. Ah, Mr. Harker, I hope you are recovered. You will perhaps find something on our table to suit your appetite. Oh, my dear Count, it is a feast. Excuse me that I don't join you. I have already eaten. Ah. The pheasant is roasted without paprika, Mr. Harker. <laughs> well, I'm most obliged to your cook, I'm sure. I would like to hear more about your journey, Mr. Harker. I trust you were comfortable at the Golden Crown Hotel. Oh, indeed. It was very agreeable. Although, <clears throat> the mistress seemed particularly concerned about my coming here. Ah, yes. The town folk are always in awe of this castle. Its history goes far back, you know. The stories are not always pleasant or understandable to the outside world. They seemed frightened of the place, of my coming here. But will you not join me with this excellent toque? Thank you, no, Mr. Harker. Wine is not to my taste. But you were saying about the townspeople of the streets, sir. Yes, well, uh... The Count asked me many questions about my journey, and I told him, by degrees, all I had experienced. When I had finished, we sat before the fire, and I had an opportunity of observing him more closely. His massive eyebrows, the mouth rather cruel-looking with sharp white teeth, and a general effect of extraordinary pallor. And most strange, there were hairs growing on the palms of his hands. You are observing me, Mr. Harker. I am Boyer of the Sectlies, descended from the Huns, from Attila. <laughs> it's a long and heroic lineage, and I shall tell you about it one evening. But it is already nearly dawn, and you must be weary from your journey. Oh, I say. That howling again. Ah, yes. Wolves. They seem to follow us all the way from Borgo Pass. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. Music? It is difficult for you dwellers of the city to enter into the feelings of the hunter. Your bedroom is ready, Mr. Harker. Sleep as late as you will tomorrow. I have to be away till late afternoon. So sleep well. And... Dream well. Good night, Mr. Harker. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt. I fear. I think strange things which I don't dare to confess to my own soul. May 7th. I slept most of the day. It was nearly sunset before I arose and ate the cold breakfast laid out for me. Then, while it was still light, I ventured through some of the hallways of the castle. There are odd deficiencies about the place, considering the extravagance. No bells to call a servant, for instance. No servants to be seen, for that matter. Nor was there a looking glass for my table. Fortunately, I brought a little shaving mirror with me. Later, I found a library, richly furnished, candles lit. There were many English books and magazines, mostly about England. Geographies, histories, geology, law lists, many detailed maps of London. Ah, oh, Mr. Harker, I'm glad you found your way in here. There is much that will interest you. You have studied England extensively, Count Dracula. Indeed. 
Since I have decided to visit your country, these books have given me hours of pleasure. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, all that makes it what it is. And it is my business with you, Count Dracula, to make this possible. Yes. Tell me about the house you and Mr. Hawkins procured for me. Well, it's at Purfleet. You see, uh, here, here on this map. Ah, uh, poor fleet, eh? Uh, on a by road, but it perfectly answers your specifications. Very large and very old. Ah, yes, very old. It's built of heavy stones and I'm afraid in need of much repair. And very private. Oh, some 20 acres around it. Ah. It's called Carfax. From the French, I believe. Quatre faces. A four-sided house. Mm, possibly, Mr. Harker, it refers to a place where four roads meet. A crossroad. Where, in your English folk tradition, suicides are buried. Um, so as to prevent them from rising again. From the dead. Oh, yes. Mm, possibly. There are many trees around the house, which makes it rather gloomy. Well, Mr. Harker, it sounds very suitable. I'm glad it's old and big. I myself am of an old family, and I do not see gaiety or mirth, nor much sunshine. I am no longer young, and my heart, through weary years of mourning over the dead, is not attuned to brightness. Moreover, the walls of my castle are broken. The shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade and the shadow. Good heavens! What was that at the window? It looked like an enormous bird. Possibly a bat, Mr. Harker. They come about often after sunset. Sometimes they are attracted by a lighted candle. They are very hungry after their long sleep through the day. As you must be, Mr. Harker, come, your dinner is laid out for you. I will join you for conversation. I have already eaten this evening. And you can tell me more about London and my future dwelling there. We must go over the street maps, and I want to be thoroughly familiar with everything in my dear new country of England. And so we spent the night as we had done the previous. Still no sign of any other person in this strange and frightening place. I have been uneasy about it. Indeed, when I drifted off to sleep shortly before dawn, dreams came upon me immediately. Vague horrors which in the morning I couldn't recall. image of man's vanity. I allow no mirrors in my castle, Mr. Harper. See, it has wounded you. You are bleeding. It is nothing, Count Dracula. You startled me. I did not see you enter as I was shaving. It was the razor, not the glass. But you bleed, Mr. Harker. You bleed. I have a plaster. You must not infect your open wound, I will attend you. <laughs> you wear beads, Mr. Harker. A pendant, a crucifix uh, given me by the mistress of the inn. You see how simple and charitable our country folk are, and full of so many superstitious fears. But still, Mr. Harker, you must take care about cutting yourself. It is more dangerous than you would think in this country. Then he withdrew without another word, and I attended to my own wounded chin. Indeed, I had been startled when he first spoke. I hadn't heard him approach. But more interesting, I hadn't seen him in the mirror while I shaved, though the reflection showed the entire room. After breakfast, which was again laid out in the adjoining room, I explored the castle during the remaining hours of daylight. 
I could not find the Count anywhere. I found a room with large windows from which the view was magnificent. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. The forest reaches up to the walls of the castle and spreads in hills and mountains as far as one can see. Later I explored further. Doors. Doors. Doors everywhere. And all locked and bolted. In no place safe from the windows of the castle walls is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison. And I am a prisoner. A prisoner. <laughs> a prisoner. A prisoner. <laughs> think clearly. I must keep my discovery to myself. Count Dracula doubtless has his reasons for this. I need my reason and sanity. But I am frightened. We Zeklis have a right to be proud. From our veins flows the blood of many brave racers who fought as the lion fights for lordship. And we were lords. Again and again they came. The Ugric from Iceland, the Lombards, the Bulgars. We drove them back again and again. Kindred to the Magyars, we crossed the Danube and fought back the Turks. And it was a Dracula who led them. A Dracula who once came back alone from the bloody field while his troops were slaughtered. Alone? Because he knew he was born to lead, never to die in battle. And he led and was master. Yes, Mr. Harker, this was a noble country then. Now it is peasants and peace. The glories of the great races are folk tales. Blood is too precious a thing in these dishonorable days. <laughs> but again we have talked all night. You must be tired. Sleep well and dream well, Mr. Harker. We will meet again tomorrow. Oh. 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 Uh, facts, bear. Meager facts. May, uh, uh, May, May 12. Uh, yes. yes. Let me begin with f facts. Not, not memories of things I saw, but facts, facts. The Count wanted to know certain things. Mr. Harker, may a man in England have a dozen solicitors or more? He may have a dozen if he wishes, but only one can act in a transaction at a time. Well, can one solicitor attend, say, to banking? Another to look after, say, shipping. It is often done by men of business who do not want the whole of their affairs known to any one person. Good, good. Have you written, Mr. Harker, to our friend, your employer, Peter Hawkins? No. I have not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anyone. Then write now, my young friend. Write and say that you shall stay with me for a month. A month? So long? Yes, I desire it. A month. Discuss only business in your letters, and it will please your friends to know that you are well. Tell them you are well, Mr. Harker. Then give me your letters, and I will see they are posted. 
Now I have much work to do. Let me advise you, Mr. Harker. Should you leave these rooms, you must return to them to sleep. The castle is old, with many memories. Bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. But here, my young friend, you will be safe. I understand, Count Dracula. Good. And again, good night, Mr. Harker. I quite understood. But could any dream be more terrible than the horrible gloom and the mystery that seemed to be closing in around me? I have placed the crucifix over the head of my bed to free myself of dreams. This nocturnal existence is destroying my nerves. All sorts of horrible imaginings. There is a tall casement in my rooms that looks down over the courtyard and across the hills. Tonight, moonlight bathed the castle walls. There was some peace and comfort in the view until I saw what did I see? As I leaned out, something ahead from a window far below. The Count Dracula. Then the rest of him emerging slowly from the window. And then face down crawling like an animal down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss. His cloak spreading out around him like great wings. What manner of man is this? Or oh, creature. I feel the dread of this place overpowering me. And there is no escape. There is no escape. May 15th. I have seen him again leave the castle as he did before. Now that I know he's gone, I am free to explore with a lamp from my rooms. Passageways. Small courtyards. Most of the doors locked. But I found one at the end of a stairway that must have been forgotten by the Count. It seemed to be locked, but gave way with a little pressure. It led into an ancient part of the castle. An enormous room, but richly furnished. And the most inviting quarters I have yet seen in the castle. Huge windows overlooking a great valley. The moonlight was so bright, I hardly needed the lamp. Great comfortable chairs and sofas. Strings of cobweb hanging from the cabinets and chandeliers. And the dust of centuries on everything. But I found it strangely inviting. I sat for a moment near a window looking out at the distant mountains, resting in the rich comfort of the scene. The Count's warning came to mind, but in the soothing moonlight, I took some tired pleasure in ignoring it. I had the feeling of belonging to those great days of times past, what it must have been like to sit in ease and tiredness after the great battle in front of these my windows, seeing out as I dazed upon my bus estate. Mr. Harker has come to us. Mr. Harker was lonely, all alone over there, <laughs> with only him to talk to. I may have fallen asleep. I was not alone. Three women seemed to be amused by my presence. 
Itu udah rame. Mr. Harker. We waited for you. Ever so patiently. We knew you would come. Brilliant white teeth. And terrible red lips. Now you are our guest. My first. Yes, dear sister. We will follow. She was kneeling beside me. Young. Bent over me. Thrilling. Oh, there is Repulsive. Yes. Licking her lips like an animal. And then lower went her head. To my throat. I could feel the breath on my neck. And her teeth against my skin. And touching. Just touching. Posing. Yes! <laughs> How dare you touch him? How dare you? This is my I am done with him. He is yours. Now, go. I must awaken you. There is work to do. And what about us? Well, we do have nothing tonight. What have you brought for us? What did you bring back? <laughs> there, in the bag. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh, oh. The sweet little creature. Oh, oh, oh. So warm and so bright. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and as I looked, they disappeared. They simply faded into the rays of the moonlight. Then, as the horror overcame me, I sank into unconsciousness. I woke up my bed. It, it was daylight. I, I tried to think. And then I ran again through the castle to find a way out but there was no one there no one could hear me and then it got done again i want you to write three letters three letters one saying that your work here is nearly done and that you will start for home within a few days my work is nearly done. Start for home. A few days. In the second, you will say you are starting out on the morning after the letter's date. In the third, you have left the castle and arrived at Bistritza. With the post so few and uncertain, it is best to have news of your safety on its way. To reassure your friends in London. Of course. You are quite right. What dates should I put on the letters? Yes, dates. The first should be June 12th. The second should be June 19th. The third should be June 29th. By then, I shall have concluded my business with you. May 28th. I wrote the letters. He has not yet discovered this journal. He wouldn't understand it if he did find it. It is entirely in shorthand. There were gypsies. They camped in the courtyard. I tried to get a message to them. Letters to Mina and Mr. Hawkins. But they returned them to the Count. He must have brought them here for some sort of employment. They have been digging in the cellar. Help! Help me! Please! Please help me! I am a prisoner here! They only laughed I and pointed at me. I am in great danger! Help! Help Something me! Something the Count me. told them, perhaps. Then, they left in carts with large boxes filled with earth. Comfortable, Mr. Harker? Yes. 
I'm very comfortable. Have you written the letters? Yes. Here they are. Very good, Mr. Harker. Sometimes, Count Dracula, it seems I... I can see the firelight through your body. Ah, illusion, Mr. Harker. The darkness and the shadows play strange tricks. I think I am ill, Count Dracula. May I see it, Doctor? Only tired, Mr. Harker. Go to bed. There is the surest cure. I must be about my many labors for my journey to your country, Mr. Harker. Sleep well. Dream well. In the morning, I discovered the door to my room had been locked from the outside. But there was at least a window. I could look out at the forlorn and desolate forest and at the walls of the castle. There below, the window from which I had seen him depart so many times. In my desperation, I saw also the great stones between his room and mine, most of them jutting out, wide enough to cling to, and a ledge that crossed the front of the castle. Just don't look down. Perhaps I can find the keys to the doors, one stone to the other, holding on step by step until by some miracle and my own desperation, I reach the sill and the open window and finally I stood inside. An old ruined chapel, full of debris and coffins. Or boxes like coffins, full of earth, with covers open but ready for nailing. One box or coffin in, in the center was closed with nails in place for fastening. The Count lay inside on a pile of newly dug earth. He was either dead or asleep. His eyes opened. No movement, no breathing, no pulse. On his lips, gouts of blood. It trickled down his mouth as if he had gorged himself. But he looked younger. His white hair had changed to deep steel gray and a mocking smile on his face. This was the monster I was sending to London. No. 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 I'd rid the world of him. A shovel. A shovel would be enough. To crash the demon's head and that bloated face. <laughs> but the head turned. The eyes paralyzed me. The shovel hit only the lid of the box, which slammed shut. 
had hid the horror from me. <laughs> June 30th. These may be the last words I write in this diary. My door has been locked. My calls to the Ziganes would be useless. They are loading the boxes and taking them away for the long trip to London. Now, I am alone here. No. Not alone. Am I there now? Perhaps I could climb the castle walls from the window. To fall, at least, is better than to be devoured by those monsters. My darling Nina, I may find a way of escape from this dreadful place. I may find a way. <laughs> came of me after the whole terrifying episode at the castle of Count Dracula, you shall presently hear. But we must take up now with the story as it was lived by my brave friends and my dear Mina, which began some weeks earlier. Our records for these events are all here in the journals of Dr. John Seward, and the diaries and correspondence between Mina and her dear friend, Miss Lucy Westenra. On May 9 of that same year, Mina writes, My dearest Lucy, I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be nice to see strange countries. I am longing to be with you at Whitby by the sea. Tell me all the news when you write. I hear rumors of a tall, handsome man. Arthur Holmwood, I've told you everything since we were children. So, dear Mina, I want to tell you everything now. We are in love. We will be married. You must come to Whitby immediately, and I can tell you all. It will help to have you with me while Arthur is away. We can walk every evening across the old abbey to the shore. Dear Lucy, I would feel so much happier for you if I were not so worried myself. For Jonathan? I haven't heard from him for a whole month now. Letters are always delayed from those remote places. At least you know he's thinking of you. Oh, he is. I'm sure he is. I shall ask Dr. Seward to visit us. That will distract you. Dr. Seward? Oh, that's the hardest thing to tell. He often comes to see Mother and I. He's a doctor, only 29 years old and has an immense asylum under his care. A, a lunatic asylum? Just fancy. Arthur introduced us. He's the most resolute man I've ever met, but calm, imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. Ah, and over you? No. Alas for him. Oh, dear Mina, that's the sad thing. But he was calm, as always. You mean he proposed? He didn't know about Arthur and me. When I told him how resolute and sad he was... And calm. He simply smiled, wished my happiness, and never mentioned it again. He told me a lot about his patients. At the asylum? Yes, one in particular who collects insects. Richard Renfield. Dr. Seward's patient to whom he now turned with more concentrated interest. A more curious case than many others in Dr. Seward's care. A sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom and elation, 
and some very strange habits indeed. You see how easy it is to catch a fly? That's because I'm kind to them. I feed them. See how well fed they are? But there are too many, Renfield. I appreciate your love for your pets, but many have escaped. They bother the other patients. You'll have to get rid of them. Ah, I will get rid of them. May I have a day? Yes, you may have a day. May I have two days? No more than two, Renfield. Good. I shall clear them away in two days. June the 5th. The case of Renfield has grown more interesting. He's turned his mind now to spiders, whereby his flies have diminished appreciably. But the spiders have become as great a nuisance as the flies. I find them in the closets. There are spiders in the dark everywhere. I'm very kind to them. Yes, I see they are well fed. Yes, they eat the flies. But now you have too many spiders, Renfield. I'm very good to them. I feed them every day. But there are too many. You must find another hobby. There are many flies. Only this time of year. And if you weren't so untidy with your own food, you wouldn't draw so many. It doesn't hurt when I hold them by the legs. See how well fed they are? Yeah, indeed. Watch, Dr. Seward. Renfield. Mm. Oh, Renfield, you ate it. It's very good. Very wholesome. But you ate it alive. Oh, yes, it is life, Dr. Seward. It is life. All animals eat life so they can give life. Well, I trust you will find some other way to get rid of your spiders. Oh, yes, the spiders. See how full of life they are. July the 8th. We are progressing. He managed to get a sparrow, and within a few days, a whole herd. The spiders have diminished, and the birds tamed. A very great favor, Dr. Seward. Well, what now, Renfield? Ah, uh, Doctor, a little playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed. A kitten? Why not a cat? Oh, a cat. Yes, I'd rather have a cat. A grown-up cat. Well, I'm afraid they won't allow it, Renfield. Oh, a kitten, then. I'll see about it, but I'm afraid they won't allow any animals. And what happened to the birds, Dr. Seward? He said he let them go. Well, I hope that was the end of it. I'm afraid not. He was very sick for a few days. I'm afraid he ate them, feathers and all. Oh, Dr. Seward, are there many patients in your asylum like that? No. Renfield's a peculiar kind. I've classified him as a zoophagus maniac. Oh, dear. What does that mean? Uh, life eating. He desires to absorb as many lives as he can. Many flies for one spider, many spiders for one bird. That's why he wanted a cat. But where would that lead to, Dr. Seward? Yes. It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. To find out? I should like the secret of one such soul. How well the man reasons. He values life, you see. The higher the species, the more life it requires to feed upon. I wonder how many lives he values a man. Indeed. We want to show you Whitby Abbey, Dr. Seward. Mina and I walk every day to the Abbey. We pass the time waiting. Lucy for Mr. Homewood and I for Jonathan. Ah, yes, Mr. Harker. I am very anxious. Jonathan's employer received a note from him, only a line dated from Castle Dracula, saying he's just starting home. It wasn't like Jonathan. Castle Dracula? In Transylvania. Ah. Oh, dear. Dear, it must be that dog. Where do you suppose it is? Dog? From the Demeter, a ship that came ashore during the storm we had several nights ago. A terrible storm. It was all in the papers. Come over here, you can see it. We were watching from here. They were unloading what they could. Just boxes. There, you can see. But there are no shoals there. Oh, yes, I see. It's, it's simply grounded. Was there fog? No, a storm. The ship had been abandoned. Only the captain was found, tied to the wheel. And he, poor soul, dead for several days. A very strange story. A log was found. Something frightened them one by one to abandon the ship. You mean they threw themselves overboard? Something like that. It said it all in the log. What ship was it? A Russian ship. The Demeter, from the Adriatic. Demeter, the mother of Persephone. Ravaged by Hades. Ravaged? Well, she became queen of the underworld. Look, they're still unloading. Boxes. Yes, boxes of earth, they say. To London, they say. Ah, oh, Miss Murray. They've gone out, Lucy and Dr. Seward. Ah, oh, poor Dr. Seward. But, 
Oh, Miss Murray, I did want a chance to talk with you. Believe me, Mrs. Westenra, I am eager for Lucy's happiness now. When will Mr. Homewood return? Oh, very soon, I'm sure. But I must speak to you about Lucy. What is it, Mrs. Westenra? It is her old habit. She has taken to it again, Miss Murray. Habit? From her father, I fear. A very troublesome affliction. But what? Walking. Walking? In sleep, Miss Murray. Lucy? My dear, there is, I fear, no cure. But also no immediate danger. Except walking on high places, of course. It has caused me, dear Mina, such anxiety. And I dare say sleepless nights. But I think there is little to fear. So long as she walks only to the garden and back. But while you are here, if you could lock the door and keep some watch on her bed. Oh, indeed, Mrs. Westenra. I dare say it is the waiting that disturbs her. For Mr. Homewood. Mina later confided to me her curiosity about Lucy's strange habit. What indeed had she shared with her father? What indeed in herself had, perhaps, brought her to the terrible fate that was to come? Lucy does walk. She tries the door, then goes about the room searching for the key. Lucy? Lucy, dear! Then she stands at the window, staring out at the ancient abbey. Another week gone, and still no word from Jonathan. August the 11th, 3 a.m. Tonight, she must have found the key. I awoke and found her bed empty. I knew of only one place she might be, Whitby Abbey, and hurried there to find her. Fortunately, the moon was bright. I could see her sitting in our favorite seat near the east cliff and the great dark ruins of the abbey. A cloud passed over the moon and hid her for a moment. Then when she was visible again, there appeared to be a figure behind her, leaning over her. Lucy! Lucy! I ran to her, but when I reached the spot, she was alone. Lucy, my dear, here, let me put my shawl over you. Let me help you. Now, stay sleeping. Just walk if you can. Look, just lean on me. Let me guide you. There. Oh. Mina? Oh. Oh. What's wrong? Why do you hold your throat? Oh, dear, did the pin from my shawl catch you? Oh, I'm so clumsy, Lucy, dear. No. No, Mina. It's all right. I'm all right, my dear. You must not tell Mama. Promise me you won't tell Mama. She went quietly to sleep then. I locked the door and tied the key to my waist, but I saw in my clumsiness I did wound her. Two tiny punctures on her throat. Fortunately, they cannot leave a scar. They are so tiny. As I dropped off to sleep, the moonlight shone through the window. A bat flew across the light back and forth. For a moment it seemed to hover across the window. Its shadow darkened the room, so close that I could see its tiny red eyes before it disappeared. Now, how pleasantly warm it is today. We shall have our tea out here. Has Lucy told you her good news? Good news? From Arthur? Oh, yes. From Arthur. His father is feeling better. He will return here. Oh, Lucy. Soon? Soon. And the marriage? Very soon. He says as soon as possible. It is a great comfort to know that Lucy will be... Protect it. Yes, indeed. And we both would be happier to know the same for you, Mina, dear. Yes. Have you heard from Jonathan? No. 
N no word yet from Jonathan. I know I must be patient, but I wish I could be sure of his safety. Each night I'm awakened by Lucy trying to get out. I still have the key tied to my waist during the night. She goes then to the balcony. And stands there in the moonlight. I'm afraid to waken her, and it seems safe enough. She just remains there, and I watch and sometimes doze off for a few moments. She appears to be growing weaker. I don't understand. She eats well and enjoys the fresh air, but the color in her cheeks is fading and she becomes more languid day by day. Shall we walk to the Abbey, Nina, dear? It will be lovely at sunset, before all the night sounds come. Night sounds? Oh, dear. I don't quite know, Mina. Dreams, maybe. Yes, you were uneasy in your sleep again last night. I wanted to be at the Abbey. I don't know why. I was afraid of something. I seemed to be sinking into deep green water. My soul seemed to be going out of my body, floating in the air, all about, over the ocean. I could see fish leaping out of the water. Then, as if I were in an earthquake, I saw you shaking me. <laughs> <laughs> and you were shaking me to bring me back. <laughs> Lucy, these dreams leave you exhausted in the morning. You're pale, and the little wounds in your neck haven't healed. Oh, that is nothing, I'm sure. Yet you hide them with your scarf. They are not healed, and it is all my fault, I fear. You see, they are still open and larger than before. The edges are faintly white. I shall insist on the doctor seeing these. In London, perhaps. London? Yes. Oh, Arthur sent word. His father is improving. He is driving there next week. So we will leave here. And then Arthur plans that we shall be married. Oh, Lucy, how happy you shall be then. Yes, we shall be very happy then. Miss Murray? My dear Mina... A letter for you. For me? From Jonathan? From London. It's addressed from Mr. Hawkins. Jonathan has been ill in Budapest. I am to leave immediately to go to him, to nurse him, to bring him back. Oh, Lucy, I'm to leave immediately. It doesn't matter anyhow. You can't keep me here. I'm going to get out of here. We saw it coming on, Dr. Seward. These last days he's been growing more excited, and today he tried to escape across the back fence. He fought like an animal. It's all right. I'll speak to him. Let me in. I'm not sure it'll be saved. It will be all right. Very well. I'll keep watch here. Renfield. I don't want to talk to you. You don't matter now. The master is at hand. Master? Yes, master. Master! Master! Oh! Oh! Dr. Oh. Seward, are you all right? Oh. Yes, yes, I may need your help to calm me. Get away from the window, oh, Renfield. You'll cut oh. yourself. You can't get out through the bars. Oh. Attendant, get a needle oh. ready. Oh. oh, when the time comes, I will be free. Master! Down, Renfield. Calm yourself. The needle attendant, quickly. He was, sir. If I can just hold him still, it'll be all Master. right, Renfield. Master! Oh. Oh. All right, Attendant. Oh. It acts Master. very quickly. Help me get him into his bed. Right, right. Oh, Master, I shall be patient, but it is coming. It is coming. I shall be patient.
In looking back, it is indeed curious that we were not more able to anticipate the events which Renfield foresaw. He, at least, was preparing. For the others, Count Dracula could be assured that his arrival would be uncounted and his victims innocent and unsuspecting. last episode of Dracula, the location of the story shifted from Transylvania to England, and the other principal characters were introduced. One of the most bizarre is Renfield, a patient in an asylum directed by Dr. Seward, who is a central character in the story connected to Lucy Westenra, Arthur Holmwood, and Dr. Van Helsing, who enters the story later. Mina, the fiancé of Jonathan Harker, and her friend Lucy Westenra are the two central women in the story. Lucy, afflicted by nightmares and sleepwalking, grows weak and ill, and her strange sickness puzzles her family and friends, particularly her fiancé, Arthur Holmwood. Here now is the fourth in a six-part series of Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> Tragic events that now follow were documented by Dr. Seward, Professor Van Helsing, and partly by Lucy Westenra herself. During this period, I was recovering from my escape from the castle Dracula. Mina came to me in Budapest, and we were married there. Later, we again enter the story, but it is doubtful that either Mina or myself could have changed the course of events that you shall now hear. Arthur Holmwood had grown ever more alarmed at Lucy's failing health and troubled sleep. A bad dream. I wish I could remember them. I thought coming here to London would change things. But you looked well when you came. Enough to convince your mother to stay at Whitby. Poor mother is not well herself. I don't want her to worry. Lucy, my dear, you do look weak. My face is ghastly pale, and my throat pains me. And oh, those dreams. Perhaps I didn't sleep. Perhaps I'm just tired. Lucy, I'd like to call John Seward. I'd like him to have a look at you. Dr. Seward? Well, perhaps it's just the change from Whitby. We could wait. Nonsense. I shall write to John today. We must take no chances. John Seward, you may remember, had been in love with Lucy and had borne his rejection in favor of Arthur Homewood with his usual stoical restraint. But now an opportunity to be of service brought him to her side with a renewed, if only professional, ardor. I can't tell you how much I loathe talking about myself. Arthur sent me to see you alone because, as he understood, I'm here, my dear Lucy, on a professional visit. He and I are both seriously concerned, but I'm the doctor. What you say is in confidence. No, you must tell Arthur everything. Well then, you are anemic, that's clear. We shall test your blood. But is there anything else, anything you remember, anything at all? Well, there is something. I walk at night. In my sleep. Do you remember these walks? Not clearly. They are like a dream. When did this happen last? At Whitby. And perhaps last night. I remember opening the balcony window. Someone was there. Someone? Or something. Perhaps a bird. There was a sound of wings. Well, would you mind if I brought a friend of mine to see you? Professor Van Helsing. He happens to be in London just now. 
We've been consulting on one of my patients. He's a metaphysician as well as a psychiatrist. Oh, dear Dr. Seward. Am I in need of a psychiatrist? He specializes in such phenomena as dreams and sleepwalking. Will you let me bring him? I'll talk with Arthur as well. I'm afraid I'm such a bother to everyone. But I will do what you say. Good. We will be here tomorrow. Now we shall see about a specimen of blood. And if I can talk with your maid, I have something that will help you to sleep. Professor Van Helsing also used hypnotism in his practice. And it was through notes from these sessions that we could piece together some of the visions or recollections that troubled Lucy's sleep. Yes, you are here. I was waiting. I am here. I come to you. My Lord. Your Lord. <laughs> Your Lord. <laughs> Barely conscious. Her maid found her in this condition this morning. Last evening when I left, she seemed apprehensive, but, but in good spirits. Well, Mr. Holmwood, this is not at the moment a matter for psychiatry. She will die for sheer want of blood. There must be a transfusion, and at once. Will it be you or Dr. Seward? We are both prepared, Professor Van Helsing. I am ready. Yes, you, Mr. Holmwood. It is your right. Come now, we will talk later about the case, and do now what must be done. Amazing. The blood comes back to her cheeks as we watch her. Mr. Holmwood, you will feel weakened, dear. Yeah? It is no matter. I can see my blood bringing her life back. Yes, Mr. Holmwood. Blood is the life, so they say. Now then, that is enough. She will be all right. Professor Van Helsing, the marks on her throat. Yeah. What do you make of those marks, Dr. Seward? Well, I noticed them before. They're more clearly defined now. No, oh, they were accidental. From a shawl, Lucy said. It happened at Whitby. An accident? <laughs> the tiny wounds have not healed. But we find no blood on her clothes or on the bed. Dr. Seward, I must go back to Amsterdam tonight. There are books and other things there that I will need. Shall we get a nurse? You too are her best nurse. Keep watch all night. See that she is fed and that nothing disturbs her. I shall be back as soon as possible, and then we can begin. Begin? What do you mean? We shall see. We shall see. Oh! All over! September the 4th. My zoophagous patient still keeps us interested. His outcries begin to arouse and frighten the other patients. I went to quiet him with a tranquilizer needle. <laughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Seward. Well, that's better, Renfield. You're frightening the other patients. I am quite deserted, Dr. Seward. I must find something to do. What about your flies and spiders? Yes, that's a good idea. I'll need some more sugar. We'll get you more sugar. No, never mind. I'm sick of all that. Go away. I'll think of something to do until he comes. Who? <laughs> oh, you'll come for me to let him in. <laughs> Who will come, he. Renfield? He! <laughs> he! <laughs> September the 9th. I feel so happy today. Dr. Seward and Arthur have taken turns watching through the last two nights. I had no dreams, 
I seem to have regained my strength. And this afternoon, Professor Van Helsing returned with a great bundle of strange white flowers. These are for you, Miss Lucy. For me? Oh, how lovely. I'm afraid they are meant to be medicine. Medicine? We will make them into a pretty wreath to put around your head so that you will sleep well. But these? Oh, Professor, you're choking. This, this is garlic. No trifling with me, Miss Lucy. I never jest. There is grim purpose in what I do. Oh, I'm sorry, Professor Van Helsing, but this does puzzle me. Are you protecting me from an evil spirit? Perhaps I am, Miss Lucy. It is an ancient custom, and these have come all the way from Amsterdam for your bedside. Now, you must do as I say. Uh, Dr. Seward and I will hang the blooms across your window like so, and around your bed like so. Take care not to disturb them, and do not open the window. And thus we can all sleep tonight. It is from Lucy Westenra's own diary, kept until nearly the fatal hour itself, that we know how close Professor Van Helsing had come to saving her life. One only wishes he had explained more of his unusual methods to us at the time. If he had, Lucy may have been spared the horror that was to come. She had indeed, by that evening, shown decided improvement. September the 11th. How good they all are to me. And Professor Van Helsing, he is so fierce. Why was he so anxious about these flowers? Oh, garlic. And yet I feel a comfort already. Oh, the pain of sleeplessness. How blessed are those whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a nightly blessing. Ah, oh, there is peace in this smell. I feel sleep coming already. My dear Arthur lies across the hall. Soon, oh, soon we shall be together. Is Miss Lucy awake yet? Not yet, sir. And I don't wonder. But she deserved a long rest. But we must waken her. There are things to be done. Dr. Seward, get Mr. Homewood. I will go to see our patient. We'll follow you right away, Professor. Good. So come, miss. You may waken your mistress. I will come with you. Poor dear. It's a wonder she slept at all. It was no wonder, miss. And she needed no sedation. I mean the racket. The racket? Oh, it roused me. I went to her room to see. What kind of racket? Well, it sounded like the balcony window, sir. Like something beating against it. And what time was that? Well past midnight, sir. So, what did you do? I went to her room and called, sir. Then it stopped. You did not enter her room? Oh, indeed I did, sir. And I don't wonder the poor girl was trying to open the window. What with that awful smell everywhere? Garlic! Poor dear. She must have found the blossoms somewhere without knowing. Then in her sleep, walks, you know, she tried to let in some fresh air. Ah, how did you find her? Oh, back in bed, peacefully asleep. But covered, covered, sir, with the weeds. Yes, covered. And she's covered still? Oh, no, sir. I removed them all. What? And open the balcony doors. 
It was such a warm night for this time of year. My God! Quickly, come with me, you meddlesome woman. What? Quickly, I say. Now we will see what you have done for your mistress. Well, I have my responsibilities too, sir. There's nothing I wouldn't do for Miss Lucy, I assure you. Ah, see now your responsibility. See what you have done? <gasps> Poor child. I'm afraid we cannot help you now. See how well you served your mistress, you miserable woman! <laughs> Professor Van Helsing, what's happened? Lucy, she's safe. Lucy. <gasps> Lucy! Is, is there nothing we can do for her? It is too late. It can't be. She was recovering. What happened? <laughs> We cannot bring her back to life. She isn't gone. She can't be. Well, there's peace for her then. Peace? Not so, my dear friend. This is only the beginning. No. For me, it is the end. But it is the beginning for us. We can do nothing yet. We must wait now and then make our plans. to see her now. I can't bear it. I wanted only to protect her. It's all right, Bertha. You, you should have been told about our precautions. She looked so like she did before she was ill. Oh, I cannot bear to see her now. Please, excuse me. For a woman, I was perhaps too severe with her. But she's right about Lucy. All her loveliness has returned. I cannot believe that she's not alive. Yes, my dear Dr. Seward. You might almost say that she has returned from the dead. Tomorrow I want you to bring me before nightfall a set of post-mortem knives. An autopsy? Must we make an autopsy? Yes and no. I want to operate. But not as you think. Operate? What do you want to do? I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. <sighs> Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? Uh, you, a scientist, and so shocked. But why? Arthur would never permit it. I shall operate. You only assist me. I must do it without Arthur knowing, my friend John. There are strange and terrible days before us. We must work together. Will you not have faith in me? I know you must not do what you say, for Arthur's sake, if not for mine. Hmm. Very well, we shall not operate now, but it will be done, my dear doctor, before this is finished, when you know more about it. Actually, my wife received their message on the day of our return to Exeter from Budapest. She took the first train to London, but of course, it was too late. I don't understand. She was so improved when I left. How did it happen? We are not sure, Mrs. Harker. A form of anemia, although Professor Van Helsing has other suspicions. What suspicions? It is a tragic affair, Mrs. Harker, but you have had difficult times yourself, I understand. I hope your husband has recovered. Oh, yes, he is recovering very well. Perhaps tomorrow he will join me here. I am anxious to meet him. Perhaps you can help us in the meantime. How? With some information. You say your husband was found unconscious along the road near Borgo Pass? He was found by gypsies and brought to a convent. He carried letters from me, and as soon as the sisters could arrange it, I was summoned. I must question you and your husband, Mrs. Harker, and you must trust me that this is urgent. I would prefer that you do not trouble my husband just yet. He cannot recall things without terrible stress. I understand. Did he tell you what happened at Castle Dracula? No. It was beyond him to remember. He still believes that it was an, a nightmare. That the things that happened were only his imagination. Then you do not know? I'm not sure. You see, he kept a journal. And you have read the journal? Yes. 
Mrs. Harker, you kept a diary yourself while you visited Miss Lucy and Whitby Abbey. I know that from her own notes. She tried to copy your habits. Now these notes, these journals, I must see them. I must study them all. They are horrors. They should be destroyed. The horrors are only begun, Mrs. Harker. I'm afraid we failed, Miss Lucy, but we must not fail again. Again? You will understand in time, Mrs. Harker, but I will need you all to trust me. But how can we trust you, Professor, until we know what you are doing? So, you will know when I know everything. Now we will sit and you will tell me about Lucy, about what happened at Whitby Abbey, and about Mr. Harker, and what happened at the castle of this Count Dracula. Is that agreed now, Mrs. Harker? Of course. I will do whatever I can to help. I think your husband will understand the urgency. I did indeed understand the urgency, but I was still too weak to join them. Mina gave Professor Van Helsing her complete confidence and the little group began to assemble the documents of our story. But the professor was cautious in revealing his suspicions. The undead? But what does that mean? It means someone who is no longer alive, but is not dead. I don't understand. A vampire, Mrs. Harker. But that's only superstition, vampire. Yeah, and according to superstition, the vampire lives, but he's not alive. The vampire lives by drinking the blood of other animals. He prefers human blood. It is a cultivated taste. And you think that Count Dracula... Is such a vampire? Yes, I think so. How can you prove it? By finding him here in London. We know that Mr. Harker arranged for his visit in Carfax. He's already here? I think we have reason to believe so, Mrs. Harker. He arrived at Whitby. You heard the story of the Demeter? The abandoned ship. The dog that escaped. The boxes of earth sent to London. But he did not leave Whitby immediately. I shall be frank with you both. Mrs. Harker, it was not your shawl that wounded your friend, Miss Lucy. It was the mark of the vampire. Lucy was the victim of a vampire. It is a suggestion, Dr. Seward. A suggestion made more horribly real during the days to follow, which began with a news bulletin from the local neighborhood of Hampstead. The police were baffled by a series of disappearances in the Hampstead Heath area. Three children were reported missing during the past several days. In each case, the child had not returned after sunset from playing on the heath. They turned up the following morning, and when questioned, they reported being with a blue fur lady. A more serious side to this story is that the children had turned slightly torn or wounded at the throat. Wounds made by a rat or a small dog. The police of the division had been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children. A blue fur lady. One made it up and the others just repeated. But wounds on their throats, that is familiar to us. Like Lucy. Dear friend John, let your eyes see and your ears hear. Have you never heard of bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and suck their blood? Good God, Professor. You think Lucy was bitten by a bat here in London? I would like you to believe things that you cannot believe in your scientific heart. What things? The same beast that attacked Lucy is attacking the children? No, not the same, Dr. Seward. Would it were so? It is far worse. How many beasts do you think there are? Perhaps only two. But I know of only one who lured the children and made the marks on their throats. The Count Dracula? No. They were made by Lucy. Lucy? Professor, are you mad? Madness would be easy to bear compared with this. But Lucy is dead. Perhaps not dead, but perhaps also not alive. For God's sake, you're talking nonsense. You will see this nonsense with your own eyes if you come with me to Hempstead Heath tonight. I won't. I cannot believe what you're saying. 
My dear friend, I understand your feelings for Miss Lucy. And you must not believe merely what I say. So we will go. Then you will see, and we will do what must be done. What about Mr. Homewood? Ah, yes. He most of all must be there, and know all that has happened. There's no time to prepare him easily. It will be difficult. <laughs> experiences at the Castle Dracula, it was possible to believe Professor Van Helsing. Lucy had been a victim of the vampire. She too now would lead the life of the undead. But to poor Arthur Homewood, it was unthinkable that his beloved Lucy could have committed those crimes on the Hampstead Heath. You're madmen! I won't allow you to disturb her grave! What you say is insane. We only want you to see for yourself, Mr. Homewood. Believe me, Arthur, he will do nothing without your consent. I will not consent to desecrating her grave. But it is not her grave until she is dead, Mr. Homewood. Are you suggesting she isn't dead? He believes that she walks as she did in her sleep and wanders across Hampstead Heath. Then you do mean she is not dead. Do you want to torment me? I say she is not dead, but I do not say she is alive. In her coffin, she looked only suspended. The color had come back. I could not believe to see Trust her. Trust me, and you will know all tonight. Now, have we your permission to enter the tomb, Mr. Homewood? Yes, yes, hurry. Have you my bag, Dr. Stewart? It is here. Then come, with this key, we begin. Bring the lamp over here. The flowers have all withered. In two weeks, her body also would wither, Mr. Holmwood. Here are the tools, Professor. Shall I help you? It is not difficult. There are only a few screws. Metal. <clears throat> Fortunately, it does not decay so quickly. Now, another. This is appalling. I can't believe this is happening. What do you expect to see, Professor Van Helsing? Is it worth such torment? Such torment, Mr. Holmwood, as you have never known, and we hope never will. <coughs> Steady with the light, friend John. That's it now. It's nearly dawn. The guards will be on their morning rounds. <coughs> I'm not very conscientious at this hour, I think. Uh, ah, so, now... Wait! I cannot bear this. Professor Van Helsing, this is cruel. Leave her in peace. It is unholy. Unholy? We shall see now. So, Professor Van Helsing, what does it mean? Empty. It means, dear Arthur, that Lucy is not here. She's alive. It means only that she is not here. Now you have seen. Are you satisfied? But where... Who could have taken her body? Enough for now. Excuse me, gentlemen, this is heavy. <laughs> we need not pass about the bolts. So, gentlemen, what does this mean? We must have more proof, no? Come with me now. At this hour, I was sure we would not have long to wait. Do you hear, gentlemen? The sound of a child? A child crying? Yes. There's someone at the entrance of the churchyard. A figure in white. 
with a child in her arms. She stopped. A mother kissing her child at this hour? Here? Kissing? Yeah. Quickly, we must stop them. Lucy! It's her! Lucy! Lucy! Wait! Mr. Holmwood, do not go near her! Lucy! He will never reach her. He must not. She's had her fill anyway, I'm afraid. Come, John, quickly, Mr. Holmwood! He stopped. He seems to be alone. Lucy? She is gone? She disappeared. Just a ghost? No, not a ghost. The undead move swiftly, Mr. Holmwood. Undead? It's a word that he should... The child on the ground. Ah, yes. The child is perhaps unconscious. Let me see. Those marks on the throat, the blood on the clothes. Now, good Dr. Seward, are you satisfied? Arthur? No. You think Lucy did this? Not Lucy. You must not think of her as Lucy. She's a monster. And your Lucy is in torment until we release her. Believe me, gentlemen, we have work to do. Come back to the tomb. It is growing light. But the child... Leave her here. If the guard does not find her, we will take her back with us when we are finished. Finished? Hi now, I have prepared you enough. From here on, I take charge. Too much depends on it. So, come. Lucy. Yes. There she is. Look at her mouth. Blood. Blood everywhere. The child? Yes. No, no, I'll not believe it. Look and you will believe that this is not your Lucy. What? Look here. I will raise her lips. <gasps> her teeth. Are those Lucy's teeth? Is that Lucy's demon smile? Look at her cheeks. She's full of fresh, warm blood. The child's. Oh, no. Mr. Holmwood, you see a vampire before you, and it must be destroyed. Destroyed? How? John, bring me my bag. What will you do? I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic. But first, this stake through her heart. No! Before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the law and experience of the ancients. There comes with the vampire the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. All that die from the vampire may, with the monster's own blood, become a vampire. And so the circle goes on, ever widening. And if they die in truth, then the soul shall again be free to take its place with the angels. So, my friends, it will be a blessed hand for your Lucy that sets her free. Whose hand? The hand that she herself would have chosen. Tell me what I am to do. A moment's courage and it is done. This stake must be driven through her heart. This stake? It will be fearful, but brief. Hold it over the heart. And here, the hammer. Hold it firmly. Then, strike hard until it is done. I have it. Firmly. Ready, then? Now. <coughs> Steady. Another strike. Lucy. Yes, my poor friend. There is your Lucy again, as she was in life. You may kiss her now without fear. Then Dr. Seward and I will finish the task.
Let Mr. Holmwood remain with her for a while. His work is over. There remains for us, dear friend John, a greater task, to find the master demon. I have clues to follow, but there is danger in it. You have learned to believe? You will help me? Yes, I have learned to believe. I will help you. There are two others that will join us, Jonathan and Mrs. Harker. We will meet and make our plan. Then, my friend, begins our terrible task. The very next day, Mina and myself were offered temporary lodgings in the comfortable living quarters of Dr. Seward's asylum. Before we met, the doctor wanted to show my wife around his hospital, including his very interesting patient, Mr. Renfield. I brought a guest to see you. Of course, naturally. And I'm always at home for a guest, Dr. Seward. Enter freely. This is Mrs. Jonathan Harker. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Renfield. Why? Uh, Dr. Seward has told me about you. Oh, yes, of course. Then naturally you are pleased to meet me. Even curious. Would you like to see my insect collection? Oh, insect. Didn't Dr. Seward tell you about my insect collection? No, I didn't. No, he didn't. Spiders and flies, mostly. Oh. Are you the one he wanted to marry? No, I am not, Mr. Renfield. Of course not. She is dead. I have a husband of my own. Mrs. Jonathan Harker. Oh. You know of me? We were just introduced. Renfield, Mrs. Harker and her husband are visiting the institution for a few days. I'm showing them around. I'm a special feature here, Mrs. Harker. Mrs. Jonathan Harker. I entertain strange beliefs. They just come and go. For instance, the belief in the prolongation of life by consuming living creatures lower in the scale, as it were. It seemed like such a good idea, don't you think? It's a curious idea, Mr. Renfield. For the blood is the life. <laughs> it's from the Bible, you know. Mrs. Jonathan Harker. Oh, I hear that name. Does your husband travel? Uh, Mrs. Harker must leave now. We have a meeting in my office. It's been a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Renfield. A pleasure? Well, think of that. A pleasure. Goodbye, Renfield. Come, Mrs. Harker. Goodbye, Mr. Renfield. Dr. Seward? Yes, Renfield. I may have another visitor this evening. Yes, Renfield, a business associate. You might say. I will entertain him in my quarters. <laughs> it will be a pleasure, I'm sure. <laughs> Come along quickly, Mrs. Harker. As you can see, our patients have unpredictable moods and imaginings. Come quickly. Mrs. Jonathan Harker. A guest in my house. <laughs> well, I must clean up, open the window, polish the iron bars, let in some fresh air. <laughs> oh, master, soon it will be dark. I await you. You are my guest. Enter freely. You are my guest. Oh, master, enter freely. Enter freely. <laughs> You have been good enough to let me study your letters and diaries. Mr. Homewood has left also poor Miss Lucy's writings as well. From these documents it is clear that the vampire that we are dealing with is strong and very clever. And his strength is added to by the dead he can command. He can appear in various forms. He can direct the elements, storm, thunder, fog. He can grow and he can become small and sometimes even vanish. How then can we destroy him? Well, we too are not without strength. We have power of combination, resources of science, and the hours of the day and night are ours equally. And of course, a dedication which is not a selfish one. Professor Van Helsing, I fear he has no limitations we can take advantage of. Oh yes, curious though they be, he may not enter anywhere unless he is bid by someone in the household. Garlic affects him and all sacred objects. 
These and more are our weapons, and the stake through the heart will finally destroy him. Superstitions? Folklore? No. We do not understand them, but we know that they work. Well then, what are we going to do? To begin, we know from your journalist, Mr. Harker, that 50 boxes of earth were delivered to Carfax. We know that the vampire must return to his native earth to sleep at sunrise. By now, we may presume that some of those 50 boxes have been removed to other locations. So, we must find them all and purify them. Purify? How? By the body of Christ, Mrs. Harker, from the Holy Communion. And so he cannot enter the boxes, and we track him down when he is weakest. At the castle I never saw Dracula in the daytime. Precisely. Their powers are weakest in the daylight, and so they hide and sleep. I will presume, Professor Van Helsing, that we do not intend to expose Mina to these hazards. We are all of us in danger now, wherever we are. But you are right. Mrs. Harker must stay here and keep a place for us to come and go. At 2.30 a.m. we entered Carfax. It was reasonably certain the Count would not be there. We were prepared in any case with a crucifix and strings of tiny garlic flowers. I led them to the chapel where I believed we would find the boxes of earth. 27, 28... I count 29 boxes out of the original 50. They can be anywhere in London. I would expect there are some accounts kept. He had to hire transportation. There will be addresses. Yes, let's find them. There must be a study or an office here somewhere. We found a study, and indeed there were accounts. For the next several hours we learned what we could, and only later what we couldn't know during those hours of the Count Dracula. Master! Master! Enter freely. Enter. I didn't feel sleepy, and there were the strange sounds from somewhere in the asylum. For Mr. Renfield, perhaps. Then, silence. I arose and walked to the balcony. The moonlight threw great shadows across the lawn and garden, but there was a thin streak of white mist moving toward the house. Then I became tired and went back to bed, where my thoughts drifted into a dream. The mist had reached the balcony and drifted into the room. The gas light I had left on for Jonathan became a tiny red spark through the mist. October 1. Mina asleep when we returned from Carfax. I did not disturb her. This morning she seemed weak and spiritless. We must not worry her too much. It would be best, Mr. Harker, if we three agree to tell her nothing about our task until the danger is over. She must be in good spirits to do her work for us here. I expect her sleep was disturbed last night knowing where we were. Dr. Seward was preparing her a sedative for tonight. We must first of all continue to search for the missing boxes of earth. Tonight we go back to Carfax and purify all those boxes with the wafers of Holy Communion. Dr. Seward will search out today the addresses that we found last night. In this way, box by box, we shall narrow down his whereabouts until finally we will find him. Bring him to me. Bring Dr. Seward to me immediately. Bring Seward to me right now immediately. Do you hear? Do Renfield, you hear? what's the matter? You must get a new patient, Doctor if you wish to continue your studies of zoophagy. Ah, I see you are collecting flies again. Only to observe them. Have you ever noticed their wings? They operate like psychic faculties. According to the ancients, 
The soul was like a butterfly. Are you interested in souls now? No. Life is all I want. Things purely terrestrial. I can't be responsible for souls. Understand me, Doctor. I will not be responsible for souls. But what about all the souls of those flies and spiders and birds that you've eaten? Bugs and birds. I say souls. Human souls. I won't be responsible for souls. That's why I must be released immediately. That's impossible. You know it is. Yes, I know it is. I just wanted to ask. I must leave you now. I am in danger. You must release me. I will visit you later. Dr. Seward. Yes? You have been very considerate to me. I am very grateful. Thank you, Renfield. Goodbye for now. Goodbye for now. Six boxes to 197 Chuck Sale Street. Six to Jamaica Lane, Bermondsey. Eight to the house on Piccadilly. And 29 here. That leaves one unaccounted for, gentlemen. Only one. One is enough if we don't know where it is. So let us begin to sterilize. Here are the wafers, one in each box. We open them. <coughs> then crush the wafers over the soil, like so. Leave the boxes open until we are finished. Here are the wafers. And as we proceeded from box to box, I imagined the demon's rage growing in fury as he discovered our scheme to track him down. Once again, we can only reconstruct his whereabouts during those hours from later accounts and discoveries. No, no, I changed my mind. You didn't send me food. You said you would send me animals. You are the animal, Mr. Renfield. Now you are of no use to me. Away, away! No! You promised to take me with you! That man, I want nothing of you! Off me! No. Off me! No! Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> Jonathan? Jonathan? Have you come back? No, no, it is I, Dracula. It is I who have returned, Mrs. Jonathan Harker. Ah, yes. I was waiting so many hours through the day. Ah, yes, waiting through the hours till now. And so I am here. Yeah. Yes. You are here. Yes. Here, here. <coughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, yes. Here. Oh. I am growing cold. And I oh. grow warm with the blood of my enemies. Enemies. So you help those men to hunt me. They will know. And you, what it is to cross my path. And you, their most beloved one, you shall be my beloved one, my helper. You shall come to my call over land and sea. You shall be blood of my blood, Mrs. Harker. See, see my breast. <laughs> Full of your blood, how easy my nail cuts the flesh. Oh. Oh. How easy the blood flows. Drink now. Drink it. Drink it. Drink. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Enough for now. Well, well, one more time. Only one. I will return. Rest now. You will need all your strength to await another day. Then you too will ride the night. And we will build our army. And I shall rule again. Rule again. 
<laughs> Rule again! <laughs> At Count Dracula's house in Carfax, Professor Van Helsing, Dr. Seward and I worked the night through sterilizing each of the boxes of earth with the sacred wafers. When we returned to the hospital, an attendant was waiting to bring us to poor Renfield's quarters. No, you are not my master. You are not my master. He was lying in a glittering pool of blood, the face horribly bruised. Renfield. I'm afraid his back has been broken as well. Renfield. Oh, you have failed. Can you hear me, Renfield? Who has failed, Renfield? Dr. Stewart. Professor Van Helsing. We are here to help you. But there isn't time. Tell us what happened. Who did this to you? Save her. Her? Who? Mrs. Harker. Mina. Save her if it isn't too late. Her soul buzzes round me. But I will not have it. I cannot devour a soul. Quickly! We must get to her! Yes, hurry! Yes, hurry. Mina! Mina! Oh, she's here. Asleep. I, I can't see. Bring the lamp. I have the lamp, Professor. Here. Oh, my God! Blood! The place is covered with blood. Mina! Quickly, Dr. Seward, have Mina. you my case? Call the maid for towels and hot water. She'll be all right, but we must oh, act quickly. Yes, yes, I'll get your things. Mrs. Harker, can you hear me? Is she alive, Professor Van Helsing? Oh, yes, she is alive, Mr. Harker, and awake. Jonathan. Jonathan. The wound's on her throat, Professor Van Helsing. That monster was here. How could he have entered? Renfield, I'm certain. He must have mistaken his master's intentions and then tried to stop him. I'm afraid we were unprepared for this. We will not be again. Mina, Mina, are you awake? I had a dream. A horrible dream, Jonathan. Oh, Mina, you are safe now. Blood? Blood? No! Oh, no! Mina, Mina, please, please calm down, Mina. We agreed there must be no further concealment from Mina. But it had been a terrible ordeal, and it wasn't until the following night that I could allow Professor Van Helsing to assemble us all together. I remained with Mina the entire day, but she hardly spoke. I am sorry to ask you to remember that nightmare, but it is essential. Did he force you to drink his own blood? Yes. He held my head to his breast. He had torn his flesh with his own fingernails. My dear Madam Mina, are you not afraid, if not for yourself, then for others from yourself? Professor Van Helsing. No, Jonathan. I am indeed afraid. For those I love. And my mind is made up. Made up? If I find in myself, and I shall watch keenly for it, a sign of danger to any I love, I shall kill myself. Mina! You would not kill yourself. I would, if there were no one who loved me to save me such a oh. desperation. We will save you if ever it came to that, as Mr. Holmwood proved. But you will not die. On your living soul, I promise you that you will not die. This crucifix, you will wear it at all times. You say that Mr. Renfield tried to stop him? Renfield is dead. I'm afraid we will never know that whole story now. Dr. Seward, do you have the addresses and the keys for each of the houses to which the boxes have been sent? They are here. Good. We have our work to do. Mr. Harker, for your wife's sake, you must stay here. We can take no chances. Believe me, nothing will separate us today. No. No, my dear Jonathan. I shall be safe in the daylight. There may be some matter among the Count's papers. Your experience with him may be useful. You will need all your forces to overcome him. I regret, dear Mr. Harker, that your wife is correct. Believe me, she is safe now. We must work together, first to Carfax, then to the other houses. How can I leave her, Professor Van Helsing? We shall arm her against attack. See, we have prepared her chamber. Now, this wafer. 
On your forehead, Mrs. Harker, I touch the sacred body of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the <coughs> Holy... Stop, Professor Van Helsing! The wafer is burning into her flesh. Unclean. Unclean. My flesh is already polluted. Oh, no. No, my darling. What am I to do? When you have destroyed him, you shall be delivered of this sign. Buried for this little while, Mrs. Harker. No more delay. Come, gentlemen. I won't leave you. Hurry, Jonathan. You three must stay together. My darling Mina, I swear to you, if we fail, if in the end you must become as Dracula, you shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I shall stay with you, blood for blood. We shall remain together. No, Jonathan. Go quickly. Go with them. There is our only salvation. Here are the wafers, one for each box. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. One by one we treated each of the boxes. At Carfax, at Bermondsey, Chuxill Street. Then we waited to face him at 347 Piccadilly. It was nearly daylight when he arrived. Dracula. <laughs> so you think to defeat me, you scavengers of life? Hold out your crucifix, gentlemen. You Stay shall back. be safe. Stay back. Safe. My revenge is just beginning. I spread it over centuries. Time is on my side, gentlemen, through your women, and through them you and others shall yet be mine. No. My creatures, in the end you shall all be mine. No. Mine. <laughs> you shall all be mine. <laughs> He's gone. We've lost him. No, he is afraid of us. He has only one place to go, the one last box. We cannot find that tonight. Come, we will return to Madame Mina. He will not touch her now. No, he cannot. Come, we will hurry to her. Where are you now, Madame Mina? Can you tell us? I do not know. Professor Van Helsing, she is too exhausted for this. But this is the only way we shall find out, through her affinity with that monster. The professor is right. Tell me, try again. Oh. Where are you now? I don't know. It is all strange to me. What do you mean? There is nothing. It is all dark. Do you hear anything? Water. Water? Water lapping. Are you on a ship? Yes, a ship. What are you doing? I am still. So still. Like Death. That's enough. Now sleep, Mrs. Harker. Sleep. What does it mean? He has the one last box with him. He is on his way back to Transylvania. We must either catch up with him or get to the castle ahead of him. Water. Lapping. Dark. Yes. I hear, yes, I hear, I will come to you. Mina? Mina? Yes, I will come to you. Mina, are you awake? Let me turn up the lamp. There. My darling, you were dreaming. No, Jonathan, I am awake. You were speaking to someone. It doesn't matter. My head hurts where the mark is. Yes, it seems more inflamed than before. Oh, you are very, very pale. Oh, what are we to do? You must not come with us. You must stay here. I cannot see you exposed to that monster. Not again. Nonsense, Jonathan. I must go, and I shall be helpful. I'll always be able to tell you where he is. Dracula? Yes, Dracula. Van Helsing will see to that, 
Now go back to sleep. I will sit up a while. The moonlight is so lovely. Do you mind? No. And tomorrow we'll be on our way to hunt him, to destroy him. Do you think you can destroy him, Jonathan? Do you think you can? <laughs> Mina. Mina, what's wrong? Mina. Oh, Jonathan, help me. Oh, Mina. Mina, my darling. Oh, what am I to do? Oh, Jonathan. Oh, God, help me. Oh, Jonathan, Mina. we must hurry. Mina. We must It was as much a race to save Mina as to destroy him. And it was a race that would bring me back inescapably mile by mile to that dreaded castle. You see here, he travels by the river to Varna on the Black Sea. We shall be there a week earlier by train, where we can prepare, so that we shall be ready for him. If we can get aboard that ship. Do not worry, that will be arranged with the shipping agent. So if we catch him there, we finish the task. If we do not catch him there, we face great danger. He must not reach his castle. There is his protection. He will have the advantage there. But he eluded us at Varna. Somehow he must have found out. Perhaps through Mina. His boat had changed its destination to Galatz. We hurried there by train. But again, he was gone. And again we resorted to Mina to help us. Very quiet, moving, very dark. A boat? Are you on a boat, Mrs. Harker? Moving smoothly, but rapidly. So we know he travels by river. The Seraph, I believe, it flows closest to the Borgo Pass. And he is a day ahead. A motor launch would catch up. But we cannot take chances. We must divide ourselves up. Divide? How? You must accept my decision, Mr. Harker. I have thought this well in advance. Dr. Seward and you, Mr. Harker, will go by launch. You know well enough what you must do. If you do not catch him at the port of Peresti, hurry overland to join us at the castle. You ask me to leave Mina? Jonathan, leave me. Oh, Mina, do not worry. I shall not leave you. Neither she nor I can manage the river as swiftly as the two of you. Mina, through your journals, will guide me to the castle. I am old, but I have means to protect her, with my life if necessary. Professor Van Helsing is right. We must make use of what strengths we have. I will be safe. Believe me, Jonathan. And how many times, while I typed your journals, did I not travel that terrible journey through the Borgo Pass? She is right. No more time to waste. We must go our separate ways to catch him before he returns to his sanctuary. Our chase up river proved a failure. At Peresti, we discovered that the boat we followed had landed and deposited the cargo to a wagon with gypsy horsemen. By the time we had arranged for horses, it was already afternoon. There was only one trail from the river to the castle. Dracula was somewhere ahead of us. Professor Van Helsing and Mina were on the other road from Borgo Pass. It was from the professor's notes that the details of these terrible final scenes were taken. Ah, so, Madam Mina, you are awake. Yes. You have slept long. Was I asleep? For many hours. The mountains are wilder. We will soon be there. Yes, dear Mrs. Harker. The road is familiar to you? Oh, yes. I seem to know it well. Mile by mile. See? Round this turn. Look, across the ravine. Can you see the castle? Ah, so... Stop! Stop just a moment, Professor Van Helsing. Ho, 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 ho. It's a ghostly sight, Mrs. Harker. There are mists surrounding it. Begins to snow, I think. There is another road to the castle. Yes. From the river, Mrs. Harker. You know that road? Yes. It is very dark and rough. Riding very fast. The horses are racing. To reach the castle before sunset. And behind them is Jonathan, your husband, Mrs. Harker. 
We must get to the castle first to prepare to save you and your husband, Jonathan. To save all of us. Yes, Jonathan, to save us all. Oh, hurry, Professor Van Helsing, hurry. Yeah, yeah. More than more, yeah. Are you warm enough, Madam Mina? We are close to the castle. It has begun to snow. I am all right. Just hurry. Put the extra rug around you. You are very white. You must hold on, my dear Mrs. Harker. It's only a short way. We are still safe. We shall be there ahead of him. I know. You know that, Mrs. Harker? Yes, I know it, Professor. I know it. Hurry. Oh, ho, ho there. Ho, ho there. It is indeed everything that your husband has described. There, high up, is the room in which Jonathan was imprisoned. And there, the room of Count Dracula. I dread to enter, Professor Van Helsing. And you must not, not yet. Can you say, Madam Mina, how far behind is Count Dracula? Perhaps an hour. Then I must be quick. An hour and the sun will set. There are things I must do in the castle, and you, dear Mina, must wait here to warn me the moment that you see the carriage across the hill. That will give us time. I am terribly afraid. Yeah, yeah. There's much to be afraid of. I leave this rifle with you. Shoot when you see the carriage. Shoot if you need to protect yourself. I will take these bags with me to do what I must. Now stand guard, dear lady. I will be back very soon. But what have you for protection in that dreadful place? Only after sunset will we need protection. So, we must work. God well. The professor had brought a blacksmith's hammer which easily broke the rusted hinges and thereby entered the castle. Let me see, what, what, what the instructions, oh yes. I have to go down that corridor, oh, yeah. And here, ah, oh. ah, oh, there, yes, I recall. He knew by studying my journals exactly how to get to the chapel. Well, that, and then down this corridor. Yes, now I recall. Uh, and then what it said was, oh, I'm, what is that? Ah, the coffins. Yes, here they are, all three. Yes. Uh, and here, quickly. Uh, 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 My dear lady, so full of life in your vampire sleep. How many have stood here, such as I, fascinated by your beauty, until the sun set and your eyes opened and your hungry strength seized your willing prey. But not this time. <laughs> Oh, give me strength for this butchery, for your soul shall find peace at last, poor woman. And now, the head! Uh. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And as he watched, the writhing, pitiful creature began to melt away and crumble to its oh, natural dust. Again? Well, another friend. Three times did Professor Van Helsing perform the horrifying act. And each time, the bodies decomposed as his knife cut through the tormented head. Ah, uh, Madam Mina. Yes, I am finished here. But still, the worst to come. I must hurry. Professor, his carriage is just outside. And there too are Jonathan and Dr. Seward. They've caught up. Come quickly, we must join them. The sun is setting. The gypsies are running off. Jonathan! Jonathan! Mina! 
Professor Van Helsing, come, quickly! Help me with this, Mr. Harker. <clears throat> Help me open the coffin. We have very little time. Well done! So there he is. Count Dracula. It is too late. He is awakening. No, no, it isn't too late. It is just the right moment. I want to see his eyes open. I want him to see the strike. I want to see the horror in his eyes. And this last. And the head. So he is gone, gone to dust and to the centuries. And so that is the story of Dracula, from the journals of those of us who lived it. Hardly anyone, I suppose, would take these reports as proof for so wild a story. But we need no one to believe. And, as it was for Dracula himself, the years will wear away our story and ourselves to forgetfulness and dust. You've been listening to Dracula by Bram Stoker, the final episode in a six-part series adapted and directed by Eric Bowersfeld, and featuring Irving Israel as Professor Van Helsing, Drew Eshelman as Dr. Seward, Jenny Sterlin as Mina, and Errol Ross as Jonathan Harker. The part of Dracula was played by Eric Bowersfeld. Technical production by John Rieger. The Mind's Eye is produced and copyrighted by Radio 2000 for this subscribing station.